Hello and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. Happy New Year! Welcome to 2022, how wild! I hope you all had a lovely New Year and a holiday celebration. I personally went to the Lake District up north here in the UK for my New Year. It was absolutely gorgeous, very rainy. But if you ever are in the UK or live here anyway, highly recommend it if you really love the great outdoors. I did get a little ill though, so this is why this has been delayed. I'm so sorry about that. December is generally never a fun month for illness and it just gets colder here in the UK till at least March. So I will have to watch out for cold, but I'll keep you guys updated as much as I can. Feeling much better now. I also really hoped you enjoyed the holiday special. I thought it was a really good way to end the year and we're not even into a year of podcasting, but we're going to kick this year off with a really great and legendary monster and that's the Jinn from Arabic mythology. Now you might recognise the name Jinn, but you will most likely know them for another name, which is Genie. Jinn are described as beings made of smoke and fire with burning fiery eyes. But they are a corporal being and can be interacted with physically by people and can also touch things physically too. They live in a completely invisible world to humans, in a metaverse so to say. Sorry, I saw Spider-Man the other day and the multiverse is very much on my mind. They are also invisible to humans and humans kind of appear hazy to them so to say or blurry. Jinn can travel immensely fast. I guess they kind of travel on the wind considering they're just smoke but... They live in remote areas such as in mountains, bottom of the seas, tops of trees, in the air and in their own little gin communities, which I think is kind of cute. They do not tend to live in lamps. I will just say this. This is a typical thought when discussing gin or genies. So do try and put that aside. I mean, I'm sure there are some that probably live in lamps, but they could also live in a box. Who knows? Just... That's where I'm going, so there is no itty-bitty living space here. They do truly live in the great outdoors. That's that's all I'm going to say on that one. So according to some hadiths, which are statements of the prophet in Islam, jinn can also shapeshift and appear as something like dragons, donkeys or other animals. And the jinn also do occasionally disguise themselves as human, which they use to get closer to their human victims. Now, this gets us onto why they're in this podcast, really, and why they're considered a monster. Some hadiths say that jinn eat humans and they'll go hunting for corpses as when they touch the bones, the flesh regrows and they can eat it. This happens with their animal forms too, and they'll go live in the dung of animals to feast on the grain or the grass in it, which they can then regrow. Sounds really gross, but it is just how it is. In contrast to this though, they are considered one of the three sapient and holy creatures of Allah in the Quran, alongside angels and humans. However, all but angels are judged on the Day of Judgment and will be sent to either heaven or paradise or hell, depending on what path they take in life. This implies that potentially the jinn are the evil part of this Triforce, but they actually don't have to be. They can be good, they can be evil, or completely neutral, as they do have free will, which is kind of wild. However, it is mostly believed by scholars that the jinn were generally ignorant, untruthful, oppressive, and treacherous. This is really interesting, though, as angels in this mythology are always good, as they have no free will at all, which is almost like a weird servitude mentality, but hey-ho, we'll get onto angels in another episode. The Jinn do have their own communities, which are very similar to humans. They can get married, have funerals, decide what religions to follow, have a monarchy and laws, but this does end up causing separation, much like in human communities. This creates different types and classes of Jinn, some of which are notoriously good and some of that are evil. So let's get into some famous types of Jinn. First, I'll go into the most evil. These ones are called ghouls which are the straight-up, really nasty jinns who feast on humans and drink their blood. They specifically really love children, travellers or corpses from fresh graves, 
which they tend to make the place they hang around the most. So I would advise keeping away from graveyards. I mean, to be fair, just in general, stay away from graveyards. They're creepy places. They otherwise hang out in lonely places where they're told to represent the unknown out in the desert or abandoned places. You've also got the palace, which is another type of djinn. They're vampiric and they're also called foot lickers. Why are they called that? Well, they would attack sleeping people in the desert by licking the soles of their feet and draining their blood. I mean, that's hell on earth for me, to be honest. I have very ticklish feet, which I realise I've now just told whoever's listening to this. If you ever meet me and tickle my feet, I will hurt you. However, there is quite a funny way to avoid having your blood drained by having your feet licked. And this is to sleep either with another person and their feet touching yours, like a top to tail thing, or sleeping with your feet stuck together. That's it. They're the two the two ways to avoid it. You've then got the Hin, which are the Jin who are most in touch with their animalistic side. They're mostly found shapeshifted and they're usually into dogs. There is another type of Jin who really have a love for shapeshifting too, and that's called the Jan. The Jan were the first ever Jin to be discovered by humans and they hide in oases or in the forms of whirlwinds or in white camels. They are very neutral when it comes to people and have been known to help those they deem worthy and actually hinder the ones they don't. There are a couple of events in Islamic history that have been attributed to the help of Ajan. This is how much help they give. It really does change the tide. So, of course, I'm looking for one personally. If anyone's ever seen one, I'd really like to get in touch. Anyway, they will also kill any ghoul jinn as they apparently are sworn enemies. So that one's pretty cool. But lastly, in our proper shapeshifty section is the Siliat, who are considered the most intelligent jinn, and they often mimic humans so well that they get away with merging into human communities and living kind of normal human lives. There's the little sheik jinns, which are considered a monstrosity amongst the jinns, and are much lesser versions of one too. They're malformed and considered a half creature. But related to this, there's also the Nasnas, who are actually the children of humans and Sheik, and appear as only one-sided, so they'll only have one leg, one arm, one side of their head, one side of their body, for example, so they're all split in half. It's said that it can kill a person just by touching them, and the person would be fleshless in seconds, which is kind of scary and also kind of gross, so they're the two who are kind of related. Lastly, in this kind of category, we also have the Ifrit, which are known for being incredibly strong and cunning. They cannot be hurt with conventional weapons, but they can be manipulated by magic quite easily, so they're often either enslaved or killed by people. They are winged, fiery creatures who live in ruins or underground, and tend to keep themselves to themselves if they can. They famously helped retrieve the throne of the Queen of Sheba, which I was frequently called by my mother when I was being particularly demanding as a child. But either way, a cool historical note is that the Queen of Sheba is in most religious texts, but in Islam, depending on which version you kind of follow in the stories, it is believed that the Queen of Sheba was in fact a jinn hybrid herself. So that's super cool. It is debated if she existed at all. If you want to have a look at her history, she's a really cool character. Highly recommend it. Anyway, I got distracted by a cool fact. Lastly, we have the last two and the most powerful jinns, and definitely the ones you've heard of and think of when I say the word genie. The married is really the one we all think of when the word genie is said, as they're the ones who will grant wishes for humans. However, there's always a second side to this. There was always a bargain to get one, such as you had to battle them, you had to imprison them, much like the genie in the lamp, or just be really, really, really charming and flattering. They were incredibly proud and the strongest type of jinn. And actually, the word married means giant in Arabic to this day, so they were also massive. A really good example of one is the entity Bahamut, which is the giant fish entity in the Quran, which we spoke about in the rock episode. He's actually considered a jinn, but not a humanoid version of one. So that's quite cool. Lastly, though, when it comes to powerful jinns, we have the Shatan. This literally means Satan in Arabic, and very literally is that, and there is only really one that leads them to. This jinn was called Iblis. This story will probably ring true no matter which religion you follow if you follow one, but there are two technical stories that lead to his downfall in Islamic mythology. 
In one, Iblis was a high-ranking angel, and when the first man and first prophet of Islam, Adam, was created, Iblis refused to bow to him. Therefore, he was expelled from paradise to rule over the devils. Probably sounds familiar. <laughs> Another version is that he was already a jinn, one of these three triforce of creatures that were sacred to Allah, and when Allah asked the angels to bow, Iblis refused, as he was technically not one of them, which is right, but both stories end the same. He ends up being expelled from paradise, and much like the story from Lucifer from the Bible becoming Satan. In fact, they actually changed Iblis's name to Shaitan too, so it's a bit harsh, but it happens apparently. But yeah, they only exist to be super evil and punish humans. However, the Quran does say that they will only do so to people of no or little faith. So if you believe in something, I guess, you're pretty much safe from these legit demons. Okay, so on to etymology. Jinn is from the Arabic word jan, meaning to hide or to adapt, much like the actual jan jinn too. The origin of the word jinn is not actually known, but some scholars think it is linked to the Latin word genius, which is cool. Others claim it comes from the Aramaic word ganea, which means guardian deity, or the Persian jani, which is the name of a very evil female spirit. We do, however, have to talk about the word genie in this bit. This is the anglicised version of the word jinn. It comes from the French word genie, which basically the only difference in it at all is that it has an accent on the first e, which again comes from the Latin word genius. So basically, the English language is just very lazy, and strangely we're using a French word instead of the traditional Arabic, which is actually shorter and probably easier to pronounce if you had to learn either word, but hey-ho! Although we know they've been around for as long as the Quran have, they were mentioned loads in the Book of Wonder and the legendary 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights in English, so their origin is a little hazy, but we do know that they've been in literature since at least the pre-Islamic period, which was the first century AD, which is unbelievably old, so that is so wild. Apparently, pre-Islamic Arabs believed that jinn were almost as important as the gods, and they considered them mortal, but knew that they had a much bigger part in their day-to-day -day lives than the gods did. Poets, philosophers, musicians believed that they were inspired by the jinn who liked the human entertainment, but they did also consider them harbingers of disease and mental illnesses as they would inhabit dark places where only the more vulnerable of society would venture. So it was interesting as they were adored and praised, but they were also feared, and people constantly were looking over their shoulders for them, and considering they're invisible most of the time, I can imagine that was quite tricky. <laughs> but they did know what could kill them, so there was always that. Which maybe I should have mentioned earlier. How do you kill a jinn? Well, I did kind of answer this earlier. You can use magic if you were some kind of spellcaster, but certainly with most types of jinn, they were physically there and mortal. Not a ghost or a spirit, as much as that is in our minds as they are smoky beings. You could realistically just smack it in the head like a zombie, I suppose. That is the advised way to kill a jinn, is just hit it, that'll do. Moving on though, it is debated whether potentially these were pagan monsters before the pre-Islamic period, and these clans picked up the belief then. However, there's not really much information on this, as it is so unbelievably old, there's no real hardcore text behind it, so that's what I'm going to leave you with. Bam! Now, onto cultural significance, we have so, so many this week, so I hope you're strapped in for all these recommendations. For art, they're a really ancient monster, so they are in a lot of art, but it's mostly illustrations from these religious texts and from stone carvings. It's honestly quite hard to describe where these are best found, honestly, but if you fancy having a look, you can look up the illustrations from the Book of Wonders and um, 1001 Nights, which is honestly what I would recommend. In movies this week, we have quite a few, and this category is not on its own with that either. They are cram-packed. I have got, most famously, the Disney animated film Aladdin and its sequel, Aladdin, The Return of Jafar, with the amazing Robin Williams playing the genie. That's what I think of when I think of genies, but hey-ho. You've also got Clash of the Titans, which is the 2010 version, When Evil Calls, Kazam, Wishmaster, DuckTales the Movie, and The Outing. Now, for TV, there are a big amount. 
So get ready, there are a nice mix of all ages and all types of TV, from anime such as Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, One Piece, Dragon Ball, and then you've got other stuff such as American Gods, Charmed, I Dream of Genie, Once Upon a Time, The Witcher, Supernatural, Power Rangers, Twilight Zone, Ultraman 80, Wizards of Waverly Place, Dukes of Hazard, X-Files, Angel, Fraggle Rock, Fairly Odd Parents, Lazy Town, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. For video games, we've got a few such as Golden Sun, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, Age of Wonders, Cuphead, Destiny, The Sims, RuneScape, Final Fantasy, Wario Land, Pokemon, Baldur's Gate, Mario Party, Skylanders, World of Warcraft, Guild Wars, Uncharted 3, Metopia, Terraria, Sonic and the Secret Rings, Battleborn, The Witcher 3, and The Secret World, to literally name a few. There were so many, I picked out the ones that had the most prevalent gins in, and also ones that I knew. So there are so many if you want to continue to look these up. My book recommendation this week is a wonderful Arabic law book, which is the Encyclopedia of Eastern Mythology, Legends of the East by Rachel Storm. Or, as always, just have a read of A Thousand and One Nights in the Book of Wonders. It's such a great bunch of stories by a real collection of authors. And another one is Neil Gaiman's American Gods. There's a Jin in there. He's very cool. And Neil Gaiman is a terrific author, so highly recommend. Now it's time for Do I Think They Existed? I'm honestly not sure on this one. It's tricky as it's very ingrained into the Arabic and Islamic culture. But I really think this is an interesting one, as you kind of have to believe in a kind of spirit form of smoke and fire. Although it's believable that people can see some stuff like this, it's a tricky one to follow. I did read, though, that some followers of Islam believe that jinn cause all of the magic perceived by humans in the world, controlling magicians for entertainment, providing fortune tellers with information, mimicking voices of the dead during seances... So it is quite a fun idea that they get off on teasing us with magic, very much kind of a Beetlejuice figure. But for me, it's probably going to be a no. Although I personally struggle to get away from the Robin Williams version of the genie in Aladdin, and this is probably a super westernised view, but it's the first thing I think of when I think of them. So it's a really nice learning curve for me this week, where I could look at where one of the best animated characters comes from and the monster he's based on kind of get their kicks, I've really enjoyed looking that up at least this week, but I thought that was a really interesting one. There are so many different types of jinn, so I hope I didn't blow your mind about these, but it's really cool to learn about them and differing to the ones we all know and love, which, let's be honest, Robin Williams was amazing. Absolute legend, bless his soul. Next week, we're going back over to the east in the Philippines and we're looking at the petrifying vampiric Penangalang, who flies around with just her head and her organs out and flailing around. So come flying in next Thursday and find out more about these horrible creatures of the night. For now, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you're listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next. And I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast. And the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can be found at mythmonsters.co.uk, where you can also find us on Good Pods and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast. Come join the fun and spread this with your friends if they fancy it. They might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, babes.